<laughs> hello, hello. Welcome to our Social Justice Faculty Lecture Series. My name is Marcus Mathis. I work here in the Office of Admissions. Today we have an amazing professor from the Department of Chicano Studies. His name is Dr. Ralph Armbruster, and he's a very involved faculty member on our campus. I'm so excited to have him here today, and I'd like to have him go ahead and introduce himself. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Marcus, and, and to the whole program and university. It's good to see it over your shoulder, even virtually. Um, I am a professor in the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies, uh, started in 1998, and um, also the department chair now, so kind of risen through the ranks a little bit and, and uh, yeah, occupy that slot. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So should I just kind of plunge in? Yeah, this is going to get started. Okay, great. And I, I could, uh, yeah, again, it's hopefully, uh, you know, we're doing this via Zoom, obviously and trying to make everything work in terms of our technology. But whoever's listening out there, <laughs> hopefully um, hope you can hear me okay and, and see everything. So I'm a professor that, you know, I do focus, our department um, came out of the, the ferment of the social movement of the social movements of the 1960s and 70s. Um, of course, people know about the African-American civil rights movement, the black freedom movement, but there were also many other movements, including the Chicano movement, right? Chicano people being mostly Mexican American, but broadly speaking, um, Latino, right? People from Latin American ancestry. So anyways, we, um, our department was created in 1970. And um, so I've always been kind of interested in our department's history and interested in social justice issues, broadly speaking. So I'm gonna talk to you, you all uh, a little bit about this book that I wrote about three years ago, maybe four years ago now. And the book's called um, Starving for Justice, Hunger Strikes, Spectacular Speech, and the Struggle for Dignity, okay? So obviously at UCSB, we're known as a research one, uh, kind of a top tier, um, uh, well-known university. And the professors do research, right? They're professors in biology and engineering, philosophy, art, art music. And, and everybody does, um, really, they kind of follow their heart in terms of picking a topic that they're really interested in. And I could tell you a little bit about why I was interested in something seemingly a little bit strange, like hunger strikes. Um, and my book focuses on a series of different hunger strikes that took place not in the 60s, but in the 1990s, so about 20, 25 years ago, when I was in graduate school. And I want to focus on UCSB because that's where I work and that's just the story I know the best. And um, when I was writing this book, I developed this concept known as spectacular speech. Spectacular speech, okay? And I'm going to show you a little clip about what I mean by spectacular speech. And hopefully, again, people will be able to hear this and we'll come back for a minute. Can you say why America is the greatest country in the world? Diversity and opportunity. The uh, freedom and freedom. So let's keep it that way. Well, why is it not the greatest country, country in the world? Professor, that's my answer. You're saying yes. yes. Let's talk about fine. But Karen, the NEA is a loser. Yeah, it accounts for a penny out of her paycheck, but he gets to hit you with it anytime he wants. It doesn't cost money, it costs votes, it costs airtime, column inches. You know why people don't like liberals? Because they lose. If liberals are so fucking smart, how come they lose so goddamn always? Hey. And with a straight face, you're gonna tell students that America is so star-spangled awesome that we're the only ones in the world who have freedom? Canada has freedom, Japan has freedom. The UK, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Australia, Belgium has freedom. <laughs> so 27 sovereign states in the world, like 180 of them have freedom. All right. And yeah, you, uh, sorority girl, just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. And one of them is there is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science. 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world 
in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined, 25 of whom are allies. Now, none of this is the fault of a 20-year-old college student, but you nonetheless are, without a doubt, a member of the worst period generation period ever, period. When you ask what makes us the greatest country in the world, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yosemite? Sure used to be. We stood up for what was right. We fought for moral reasons. We passed laws, struck down laws for moral reasons. We waged wars on poverty, not poor people. We sacrificed. We cared about our neighbors. We put our money where our mouths were, and we never beat our chest. We built great big things, made ungodly technological advances, explored the universe, cured disease, and we cultivated the world's greatest artists and the world's greatest economy. We reached for the stars, acted like men. We aspired to intelligence. We didn't belittle it. It didn't make us feel inferior. We didn't identify ourselves by who we voted for in the last election, and we didn't scare so easy. We were able to be all these things and do all these things because we were informed by great men, men who were revered. First step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. Enough? Can you say why America is the greatest country in the world? Diversity and opportunity. There's uh, freedom and freedom. So let's keep it that way. Well, why is it not the greatest the country in the world? Professor, that's my answer. Okay, so I'm going to come back to our, our conversation. So, you know, welcome again to people that are joining. Um, I, uh, you know, I played that clip. It's from this show called The Newsroom. And The Newsroom was an HBO show that was done several years ago, actually in 2012. So it's quite some time ago. And the idea of spectacular speech, I want to, you know, what I want to talk to you all today a little bit about is this notion of a hunger strike and like where it comes from and why people decide to do that and why someone might be willing to die for what they believe in, in terms of like using nonviolence and using their body as a weapon to try to get people's attention. So I don't know if you could tell in this, in this clip that um, the two, there was this kind of pseudo um, ideological debate between somebody on the left and somebody on the right. A college student at Northwestern University in Illinois very, you know, high, high reputation, elite school. Uh, she comes to the microphone. Of course, you know, we're not meeting in public because of COVID. Comes to the microphone and lecture hall and says, can you state what makes America the greatest country in the world? The liberal person, so-called leftist, says diversity and opportunity. Yes, we're really great. And the other guy, the conservative, probably Republican person says freedom and freedom. And let's keep it this way. Then Jeff Daniels, the actor who plays his character named Bill McAvoy, he says, no, I'm not gonna play that game with you. I, I, I don't think it is the greatest country in the world. I reject the premise of your, your, your uh, question. And when he says it's not the greatest country in the world, the students in the audience, right? It's mostly students. They begin to actually, they, one woman like gasps, and goes, wow, I can't believe he said that, right? And then of course he drops an F-bomb and, and when he starts to speak, he spark, speaks with this tremendous passion, but also this tremendous amount of knowledge and facts and so on. And so what the students do is they get their phone. I don't know if you can see my phone, right? Then they start taping this guy. That's what we used to say, right? So he kind of like goes for it. He doesn't just use sound bites. He says something real. And when somebody speaks for real, we say, can you hear me now? That was the old cell phone commercial. Can you hear me now? And so, um, I want to play one more little clip 
that kind of gives you an idea of spectacular speech. So this is just another um, example of what I'm calling spectacular speech. Um, in about five years ago in South Carolina, after a, a white supremacist named Dylan Roof went into a mostly black church, he asked if he could come inside and pray with them. And then he pulled out a gun and killed nine people. It was an awful incident, um, very heartbreaking, very tragic. And um, you know, when he was arrested, they found out that he had the Confederate flag and other white supremacist paraphernalia on his social media. And so um, there had been a long debate in South Carolina to take down the Confederate flag from the state capitol. And this young black woman named Bree Newsom that you see in this clip, she said, listen, I'm not going to wait for the, the legislature to vote on it. They've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and we're not going to wait any longer. So she went up and climbed up this flagpole, right? Using her climbing gear. She had a, um, a white ally, a white male ally down on the ground to make sure that he would like spot her and make sure that she didn't fall. And so she climbed up there and she says, you come at me in the name of um, hate, uh, this flag comes down today, right? And so um, it was something spectacular. It was a spectacular action that I say that, that needed to be taken. And spectacular speech gets people's attention. So many times we're distracted with white noise, with you know, social media, with other things that are going on. It's hard to hear the cry of the poor, right? So somebody does something in a dramatic, spectacular way to get our attention. So back to the newsroom, Jeff Daniels is not an activist, the guy in the middle who said it's not the greatest country, but he speaks spectacularly. He's got a lot of substance, he's got a lot of passion. He keeps it real. That's what we used to say, right? He keeps it real. Um, and there was a famous Indian activist, not Mahatma Gandhi, but um, this guy named Bhagwat Singh. He says it takes a loud voice to make the deaf hear. It takes a loud voice to make the deaf hear. So in other words, to be heard, sometimes somebody must scream, sometimes with or without words. I mean, the recent Black Lives Matter protest after um, George Floyd was murdered in, in uh, Minnesota, you know, people take to the streets. Why do they take to the streets? Because nobody else is listening. Got people talking, right? Got people thinking about what are we going to do about these issues? Um, at least 10 years ago, there was a, a, a man in Tunisia, which is in North Africa, um, Mohamed Bozazi. What he did is, these are other examples. He poured gasoline over his body. He was very upset about um, uh, political issues, his ability basically to get a street vending license. The government took away his street vending license. He couldn't earn any money. He became depressed, basically. Um, but he wasn't crazy. He wanted to make a point. And so he lit his body on fire. Um, and he used his body as a, what they used to call a weapon of the weak. And that action spread out through the entire country in Tunisia. And eventually, the dictator fell in that, in that country. Um, not only that, um, his actions launched what they called the Arab Spring 10 years ago, and also what was known as Occupy Wall Street. So one person, a lot of times we think, hey, there's 7 billion people in the world. What could I possibly do to make a difference? One person can do a lot. One can, um, um, I'm really sorry about that. Um, there are um, uh, pictures in this uh, PowerPoint and in my presentation right now that are gonna be um, triggering for people and they're gonna find them difficult to see. And definitely the next picture of Mohammed Bozazi uh, is, is like that. So I apologize for that, but I think people need to see these things. The, this next picture is this, this um, gentleman named Tik Duck, who is a Vietnamese um, Buddhist monk. 
who lit himself on fire in 1963 to protest um, restrictions against Buddhists in South Vietnam. You know, and the United States was ramping up our involvement back in the Vietnam War, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So self-emulation, like lighting yourself on fire, stopping eating, going on a hunger strike, um, those tactics have been used for centuries. But most people, when they think about them, they automatically focus on men. Sometimes I ask my students, I say, who do you think are the, the most well-known hunger strikers over time? Usually they say, um, well, Gandhi, Gandhi, of course. People know that Gandhi went on many hunger strikes uh, for the independence of India from England uh, back in the 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, sometimes they say, well, what, yeah, Cesar Chavez, famous farm worker leader, um, co-founded the United Farm Workers with Dolores Huerta in the 1960s. Um, Cesar Chavez went on a number of hunger strikes. But generally speaking, that's all they can think about. They only know those two examples. And then what I kind of blow their mind is, I want to say, actually, the people that created hunger strikes as a political tactic, um, the people that, um, I'm sorry, I, I think I just blew my, um, there we go. The people that created the hunger strike as a weapon in the early 20th century were Irish and English women that demanded the right to vote. There's hopefully people know that, uh, especially here in the United States, I mean, white upper class men were the only people that were allowed to vote for from the 1770s till the 1920s, right? It was a slow enfranchisement of most of the, uh, the population. So in England, in the 1910s, 1920s, um, there were a bunch of women that decided to go on hunger strikes and here in the United States as well. Um, if we had time, I'd, I'd show you another little clip from this movie called Iron Jawed Angels. I really wanna recommend that. The 100th anniversary of women's suffrage um, happened during the summer, I think it was around August 25th, late August, um, a major event. And women's suffrage did not allow black women, Chicano women, indigenous women. It was really only for white women. It was a big advance, but not all women were granted the right to vote back in 1920. So um, there's this woman in, I'm gonna show you the slide. Well, here's, the, here's this famous um, poster that was done in the 1910s in England. Um, so in order to keep women alive, they didn't want them to die. They didn't want them to become martyrs for the cause. So they did something spectacular and then they like force fed them. They like physically held them down in the chair and like fed them like they maybe cracked an egg or something like that. And they put it into this like funnel and the person was like forced to eat. Uh, and that was, you know, considered a form of torture back then. Um, the United States has kept um, prisoners in Cuba, um, alive against their will, who have also used hunger strikes. Um, and so this, this image went viral back in the 1910s. We didn't have social media and have Instagram or nothing like that. But this, this image generated a lot of sympathy for the suffragist activists. Um, this is a woman in, in uh, her name is Irene Shamila, and she went on a hunger strike for 16 years. 16 years, you can imagine if a male, a guy, uh, had gone on a hunger strike for such a long time period, um, we might know their name, like Gandhi. Gandhi is a household name. Cesar Chavez, pretty much, hopefully, some people still know who he is. These are names that were very um, popular. But famous women activists, unfortunately, we don't know too much about them, and, and we should, from my perspective. Um, so let me go back to this. Um, Oops, I'm sorry, everybody. Here's, um, and you know, if people are, are gonna ask questions, I'm gonna be able to answer some of the questions hopefully at the end, okay? I'm, I'm not trying to ignore those questions and I see one or two of them and they're really good. Um, this is a group of people that demonstrated outside the White House in solidarity for the uh, hunger strikers at Guantanamo Bay. Again, if you go back to history during World War I, women activists, suffragists that were demanding the right to vote were the first people ever that protested outside the White House, um, demonstrating against Woodrow Wilson, who was our president back in 1917, 1918, during World War I. Um, this is just a little you know, graphic that talks about how your body is impacted and how you're, you're eventually, you're physically and mentally, obviously, 
you'll break down and could potentially die. Bobby Sands, you'll see here, Bobby Sands was a famous uh, hunger striker in Northern Ireland, went on the strike for 66 days before he passed away. Um, there are a group of people um, back in 2017 that were in um, detention centers by ICE, the Immigration Customs Enforcement, and um, they were being separated from their children. And the children showed up outside the detention center demanding the release of their parents, and the parents were on the inside on hunger strikes. So when you see a, a child who these kids to me in these pictures look like they're, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years age, um, that's a spectacular action. Children, you know, demanding the freedom of their parents. Um, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna kind of move ahead a little bit and talk about what happened at UCSB in 1994. The context of 1994, it's 25 years ago. It, you know, a lot of folks, obviously, the students who are listening to this right now weren't even alive. But 1994 was a moment like 2020. There's never been a moment maybe like 2020, so that maybe seems like messed up to say. But, you know, there was attacks on, race, on uh, immigrants. Um, racism was very intense here in California. We had this proposition known as 187 that was going to deny educational services and medical services for undocumented um, people, mostly kids. So if you were undocumented, you wouldn't be able to go to school. If you were undocumented, you couldn't go to the hospital and seek out medical attention. Uh, it was really bad. And it passed, passed by an overwhelming majority at the, um, at the polls that year. It was later declared unconstitutional. Um, in 1994, also it became harder to cross the border and more and more people started crossing the border in um, Arizona trying to survive 120 degree heat, and a lot of them died. And there are different people here that put up these crosses of the names of people that were um, dying out in the desert. Um, the other thing that was going on in the 80s and 90s in California is that we had this major boom in spending to um, house prisoners. Um, and there was so much funds that were going to prisoners, there were very few funds that were going for higher education. So this graphic shows you um, since 1980, there had been 22 prisons built, but only one university. Well, today we have another university too, UC Merced, but um, this goes to show you there's a very disproportionate funding, funding for law enforcement, funding for prisons, not funding for education, not funding for people's um, basic needs. So when you go on a, you know, a demonstration and a social movement, you usually develop a series of demands, like you know, things that you want. And back in 1993, 94, this is what the students wanted, right? And there was 10 students and they were um, Chicano, Chicana, Latina, Latino, right? Seven of them were, were Mexican origin and two of them were from um, Guatemalan ancestry. So one thing they said is that they, they said, hey, the fees are too, it's too expensive to go here. Our, our folks can't afford it. I can't afford it. And they said, no, we can't, um, fees and increase by 40% in um, 1993. So they said, listen, that's, this, is, this is really like an attack on working class people. We can't afford to come here anymore. Um, the second demand is that they wanted to increase the number of professors in our department. Remember, I teach in the Chicano Studies Department. I'm also the department chair. When the department was created in 1970, we had three professors. 25 years later, 1994, we had three professors. In other words, we hadn't grown at all. It was, people felt like they responded, but they, they just were like kind of throwing us crumbs and we wanted something more significant. So they said, let's go from three to 15. And let's also create a PhD program. Like you can get a, a doctorate in Chicano studies, right? So that's what they asked for. This third demand was absolutely critical. Recruitment and retention programs for eligible um, um, Latino students, they called, they, they were using the word raza, right? So from Santa Barbara County, Ventura County, San Luis Obispo County, they said, hey, anybody that meets the UC um, requirements for admission, what we need to do is we need to be more aggressive in trying to bring those folks to our campus. But then once they get here, we've got to retain them so they get their degrees and go on and hopefully have, uh, you know, uh, fulfill their dreams and, and aspirations for society. Um, UCSB in 1970 had 1%, all of our students, 1% Chicano. In 1994, when this hunger strike happened, it was up to 
but still 10% was very low in relationship to the entire state population. There's a, um, a really kind of sacred center at UCSB known as Building 406. It's also known as El Centro. Um, it's a, a kind of safe space where students of color, mostly Chicano students, Latino students, but not exclusively, they meet there, they hang out, they study, um, they organize, they have meals, they mess around. They're like young people. It's a space really for them to kind of be away from all the adults and do what they're going to do. And um, it's a beautiful space. And at that time, it was being slated for demolition. So they're like, hey, don't take away our home. A lot of students say that El Centro is our home away from home. Don't, you know, like the campus is alienating. They don't like us here. We feel like we can, we can play our music here. We can eat our food. We can speak Spanish. We can do whatever we want to here, right? The other thing they wanted to do is they wanted to create a community center in Isla Vista, um, and, which is adjacent to the campus. And they wanted to stop um, table grapes from being served on campus. Um, I don't know if you know this, but of course, for, for decades, um, farm workers have been like um, toxic pesticides have been dropped on them by uh, these airplanes and many people were getting cancer and other kinds of um, um, health issues as a result of that. So they wanted those um, grapes to be um, banned from campus. Okay, so this is what building 406 looks like um, today basically. This is after the building was saved, but it just kind of gives you a little bit of the flavor of what it looks like inside. That it's like, you know, very culturally sensitive and it's like that home away from home, real sacred place for people. Um, during the strike, it wasn't just Chicano folks that were involved. There were like Jewish, queer women's groups uh, were part of that. Um, they all pitched out tents in front of Cheadle Hall, which is our administration building on campus. Um, they wanted to be visible, right? So many times, that's the whole thing about doing something spectacular is that you're invisible and you ask for demands and you ask for change and nobody listens to you. And then you begin to ratchet up your voice, right? And so you climb a, you climb a, uh, a flagpole to bring down the flag or you go out and demonstrate, you go on a hunger strike, you light yourself on fire. Again, I'm not, I'm not advocating these things, but sometimes if you wanna bring about change, you've gotta make some noise, right? And so um, they slept outside Cheeto Hall. Their parents and family supported them. That was huge, you guys, if um, folks who are listening. Um, a lot of students were very fearful to call their parents to say, hey, I'm involved in a hunger strike and I could die out here. Um, very, very hard conversation. Some students' parents joined them and they also went on hunger strike. It was just really, really amazing. And I wanna say last thing here is that Chicanas and Latinas, women of color, they were involved in every aspect of this hunger strike. And um, again, women's contributions to social movements are usually ignored, depending on who's doing the speaking and this research. And as a, as a man, you could you know, see me here. Um, I think it's incumbent upon me to really recognize those contributions and not ignore them. Um, these are the students that went on this hunger strike. The strike ironically enter, uh, ended on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. Uh, 1994, uh, but they're outside the administration building. This is the last day of the strike. Um, two of the hunger strikers, one of the guys right here in the front who has his glasses on, um, were, their bodies like deteriorated and they had to um, kind of be wheeled around in wheelchairs, Edwin Lopez. Um, so that this is a better picture right here. So this was the cover of my book. Um, this woman named Naomi Garcia is on the, um, on the left and then uh, Edwin Lopez is on the right, and they're speaking in front of um, Cheadle Hall, but they're also behind them is Campbell Hall, which is the largest um, lecture hall at UCSB, about 800 students. And this is where a lot of Vietnam War um, protests and demonstrations happened back in the 60s and 70s. So here's the, here's the parents right here. Um, you know, here's um, this, this woman on the far right. She says, my son is a hunger striker. You know, like I'm out here supporting him. Um, and so there was a lot of community support. Um, th these things cannot be done all by themselves. It takes a village to make these things happen. Um, here are two of the women, Naomi Garcia and Alma Flores, um, who were part of El Congreso, which is kind of like Mecha at UCSB. If you know, if you heard of Mecha, hopefully. At the end of the strike, you know, it took, it took uh, there was 10 people, it was nine days, 
and they broke red. I don't know if you could see this here, um, but what I really love about this picture is that the students who sacrificed, they're at the table, right? The people in the middle, there's like three people standing up. There's a guy really with a long ponytail. Um, those three people right there were negotiators. So they were eating, but they were also like negotiating with the administrators in the back. So the most powerful people in this picture are in the back. That's where they belong. <laughs> and um, so they, they had some apple juice and they had a little sourdough bread. And, um, you know, one of the, Edwin, it took Edwin a full year to get back his original body weight, even though he only was on a, only on a hunger strike for 10 days. So what did these guys, what did these folks get with this? And um, I definitely am I'm anxious to, or excited to, to hear what you have to say, but what did they achieve? So if you go back to what they wanted, what did they get? They got table grapes off campus. So that was a big victory. They created um, not what they wanted per se, like a community center, but they created a teen center. And there are a whole bunch of, you know, Latino teens uh, in Isla Vista that some place don't have places to hang out, um, you know, mess around with their friends. And if they're not messing around with their friends there, then they might be getting into trouble, right? So it was good that they created this teen center. Um, building 406, um, El Centro, that home away from home, that still exists. They were able to save it. And the big thing I think was, is that the undergraduate population of Chicanas and Chicanas, Latinas, Latinos, it went from 10%, it says 27% here, but now it's 29. So um, student, a lot of times UCSB, in my opinion, likes to toot its own horn and they say, look at us, we're a very diverse campus. We're a Hispanic serving campus. But the campus leaders didn't do that by themselves they had to be forced and pressured to make reforms to open up our campus. Um, a PhD program was created in 2005 and more professors, that's the big thing. When I first started in 1998, um, people said, Ralph, you should write something about this. And I said, I will, I'll write something, I promise. It took me a long time to do it, but I would have never been hired had these students not sacrificed themselves, right? So we had three professors in 94, and by 1998, we had eight. And we went up to 13 at one point, but today we only have nine, which is really a shame. We need to have more Chicano Studies professors, in my opinion. The one big thing that they did, so they had six demands, they got five things met, more or less. The big thing that was not met was fees. Fees have increased by over 300% since the year 2000, which is awful. Um, and then if we just go, you know, if we go back over the demands because 25 years have passed, um, you know, we know that farm workers are still being mistreated today, unfortunately. We know that, that ICE raids are still happening. Immigration are, uh, authorities are deporting people. They're separating them from their families. Um, El Centro almost fell apart, but the students saved it. Um, UCSB, from my perspective, is still not fully serving our Chicanx, Latinx students. And our numbers are declining like in our department and student debt exploded, right? So sometimes people in academia and, and just in the world, we say, did that really do anything? You know, they, they made a big fuss, they raised some noise. Um, did it really do anything? And the answer is complicated. Yes, they did do something. I mean, the campus is we have three times the amount of Chicano students that we did back in 1994. That's cause for celebration, but that doesn't mean it's over. And the thing that's crazy about doing this kind of work is it's never done. I had a really great friend named Alice McGrath, white Jewish woman, lived in Ventura, was really an ally for Chicano struggles. And she said, Ralph, um, activism is like housework. You are just gonna have to continue. Like once your house is clean, you're gonna have to go pick it up again and again and again. And we're seeing that today, especially if that's the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, the fights that have, were fought years ago are being fought all over again. And so um, very difficult for us in this moment. Um, but uh, here says our Chavez, he says, it's my deepest belief, only by giving our lives do we find life. And for me, it's always been life affirming is to get involved with other people that, that give a damn, that have a deep hunger and desire for change because that's what we need to do and we need to get together with ourselves and say hey 
you know, it's really tough right now, but we're going to carry each other and we're going to make this happen. I don't know how, but we are going to make it happen. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Armbrester, for that for that awesome lecture and, you know, giving us that really strong, deep history of, of, of activism on our campus and also abroad. Really, really appreciate it. Um, we got some questions. We got a couple questions. Um, so the first I'll ask <clears throat> is, uh, would you agree that one of the biggest obstacles is not just getting the demands of the oppressed voice to those in power, but also having the oppressed be part of the implementation processes so that their visions are carried out meaningfully? Could you, I'm sorry, Marcus, could you repeat that again? Yeah, sure. Would you agree that one of the biggest obstacles is not just getting the demands of the oppressed voice to those in power, but also having the oppressed be part of the implementation processes so that their visions are carried out meaningfully? Absolutely. I mean, I think the, um, I see a, a brother that I know here that, I, that chatted out here. His name is Steve Avina, who is an alumni from UCSB. He's a, a friend of mine and um, I haven't talked to him for a long time, so I just saw his name and I want to invoke his name because he's a special guy. Um, yeah, I mean, so once the, the university always thinks that it can wait out people because the, the stay for a student is only four or five years. Um, don't be scared by the five years if you're listening. Um, <laughs> some people finish in three years. I don't know who those people are, but, um, but they can wait you out. And so the oppressed should be involved in implementation, but they, they being folks in power usually drag their feet. You know, and when they, sometimes they do it consciously, sometimes they don't. UCSB is a complex place. Most of, you know, social institutions are. You can't just snap your fingers and make it happen. Um, and so if the, if the people that are involved in the movement are not involved in bringing it to fruition, they're gonna get something that's not really what they wanted. And then they're gonna get ticked off again. And they're gonna say, hey, we're gonna have to take to the streets again. But um, yeah, I mean, I would say absolutely. The people that were most directly involved should be involved in implementation if they can. But you know, some people also say alternatively, like, hey, that's what your job is. We're paying you to like carry out these reforms. And if you can't do your job, then maybe you shouldn't be here. Maybe we should hire somebody new, you know? Because really students, if you think about it, they shouldn't be doing this 24 seven. They're in, they're in school to go to school, to go to class and do all this other kind of stuff. So they can't be hustling and going to all these meetings and putting their bodies on the line. So I think it's important for them to be there, but they, sh they shouldn't be doing that work as much as are the people who are being paid to do these jobs. And I'm one of them, frankly. Yeah, we both are, right? Okay, another good question. What advice would you give to high school students who want to get involved in societal change? Well, we, we had something amazing happen here um, after the George Floyd you know, killing, um, big demonstration here led by people mostly in their 20s and 30s. But then this, this young brother, basically um, uh, African-American student freshman at San Marcos High School in Santa Barbara um, did like a youth led march. And um, it was really amazing. And they had their own demands and they went to our SB, Santa Barbara County Board of Education, came with a list of demands. People out there on the adults in the, um, the Board of Education, they met them, they heard them out. They're trying to like continue to negotiate for those demands right now. But I think a, a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I can't do these things because I'm really young. Well, that's BS. doesn't matter how young you are. You know, uh, if you go back to the famous Children's March um, in, uh, in Birmingham, I just am always taken by those pictures because some of the older kids who were like 19, 20, 21, like John Lewis and even Dr. King was kind of a young man at that time. Um, all those guys were thrown in jail. And then they made a strategic choice to say, what are we gonna do now? And they said, well, we could bring out the kids. We could bring out the 10, 10 11, 12 year olds. And they did. And you know what? They put the dogs on them. They put the water hoses on them. And those images went viral during that time period. They said, what kind of society, you know, six dogs on kids and, and turns water hoses on them, right? And so um, of course that might not be safe. Everybody's got to think about what they can do. But what I want to encourage people to do is just because you're young doesn't mean you can't do anything. You know, there's a group of young kids that like, um, they use TikTok to um, target one of Trump's rallies. And they said, you know, they got tickets through TikTok and um, the rally was poorly attended because they used TikTok in a way to, to kind of like jam the president. It was really, you know, creative. 
And, you know, kids can't vote till they're 18. Well, don't think that you could only start doing political things when you're 18. You could do it when you're 17. You could do it when you're 12. You can do lots of things. If you have a hunger for justice in your heart, you have to figure out a way to bring it to fruition. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so another question. When do you think is the point that it is appropriate to put your body on the line to stand up for your opinion? Well, you know, it, now, <laughs> now is the time. You know, I mean, we're in a major series of interrelated crises and um, so I'll use Edwin. Edwin was one of the two gentlemen that was in the wheelchair. Edwin said that he felt like he came to a moment where he was talking a lot, but he had never done anything. It was kind of like what they used to call back in the day, armchair radical. So you'd sit at your armchair and you'd like, you'd be talking, you'd be talking the talk. And so he said, I have to, you face this internal decision, like is today gonna be the day, right? Is today gonna be the day? And really people like Gandhi and King and many others, they decided, you know, they, what they said is, um, you know what, you're, we're gonna punish you if you decide to put your body on the line. We're gonna throw your butt in jail. And you don't know what's gonna happen in jail, right? And so um, they said, okay, that doesn't scare me. That doesn't scare me. We're gonna go to jail, we're gonna fill up the jails. In fact, so many people are gonna go to jail. You can't even process all of us. We're not gonna give you the right name. We're gonna give you a fake name like Emiliano Zapata. We're gonna give you, you know, we're gonna make life hard on the jailers. So um, I think each person has to make that individual decision. For me personally, I, I, I was in graduate school. I was trying to like do this, do this, do this, do this. And I, I just held back. And one day I finally did it. And when I did that, what I mean is kind of quote, put my body on the line, not through a hunger strike, but I risked the rest. Um, it was so liberatory. It was so freeing because, you know, they got you, they got you basically um, thinking, hey, I can't do anything when you really can. And especially if there are other people at your back. It's hard to be like a walking contradiction. A lot of us are like that. I'm still like that to this day. Sometimes I like go for it. Sometimes I hold back. And when I hold back, of course I feel terrible. But I, I, you know, I have to think about what am I doing now? I'm 52, I'm like an old timer um, and I've got kids. And where could I be most effective? Um, Sometimes you can be more effective when you're 17, when you have uh, less obstacles. And they will listen to you. You know, I mean, if you look at a couple of years ago, the um, March for Our Lives around gun violence, those kids made, they changed the United States. Did they change the gun laws? Not yet, but they made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some good questions in here. Okay, so the next one, I think you might've mentioned this a little bit and touched on it also in your book. But do you know where the UCSB students um, are today? The ones that were involved in the hunger strike? Good question. Oh, that's gonna make me cry. Um, like it makes me think because there's so many good books and movies and whatnot that um, they kind of like pan to the, like what their picture was back in the day and like what they're doing now. Um, a lot of them are professors. You know, a couple of them are professors. Um, one of them is a high school principal in, in, uh, in the LA County, LA USC, LA USD. One of the guys became a pediatrician. He lives in the Central Valley. Um, a couple of them are counselors, high school counselors, right? Wow. Um, they got jammed when they were in high school and they were not being encouraged to go to higher ed and stuff like that. And so they said, hey, that's how I'm gonna make my difference in the world. So some of them became scholars, you know, writers, you know, professors like me. Some became teachers, counselors, one's a doctor. I think one became an attorney as well. Awesome. And then they have, their, they have their social lives too, which I'm not privy to, but you know, they're, they're, they're change agents probably in their homes, like being parents, maybe some of them are grandparents, <laughs> I don't know. And anyway, so they're, they're doing stuff professionally as well as personally to make a difference. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so next question. What advice would you give to a high school, I believe maybe a high school student to study Chicano studies at, at the university, at UCSB, what advice would you, would you give somebody who wants to really get into Chicano studies? Okay, and, but they're still high school right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the thing too, is that, you know, obviously I wish I could meet y'all and we, we'd be talking afterwards and I give you my phone number and just all kinds of things because it's kind of, a, that's a, it's a great question. It's complicated because some folks like here in SB, we have a, uh, Santa Barbara, I'm sorry. It, we have a, like a high school requirement now for ethnic studies, right? So people don't have to come in cold. Sometimes we have students that are 
they just come in cold to Chicano studies, ethnic studies. They never read nothing. But they're increasingly like these requirements at different high school districts, and they're trying to make it a statewide requirement so you're not completely coming from the cold. Um, Mark Twain once said, don't let school stand in the way of your education. So if you're not being uh, getting the stuff that you want in high school, then you have to be kind of industrious and kind of like a self-starter, if you will, and show the initiative and start reading books. Start like, you know, it's kind of a pain in the butt that you wouldn't be required to do it. But it's also kind of fun because you can educate yourself and you can, you know, you can do stuff on, on not YouTube, but, you know, YouTube has some good documentaries. They have some crazy ones too. Um, but there are a lot of great books out there and some of these books are free and um, you kind of have to educate yourself a little bit. So when you come, when you're in high school, which I had zero Chicano studies, oh my Lord, I had, I had no idea what was going on. And in fact, because I'm biracial, I'm Mexican and white, um, I had to kind of, when I went to college, I went through this major transformation. I mean, I always knew that I was Mexican. I always knew that I was a little bit weird. And, um, uh, and, and then I began to develop the language for it. And the language to use the word like racism, systemic racism, um, intersectionality, all those kind of verbiage, like you knew it, but you didn't know it because you didn't have the language. And then once you had the language, you're like, ah, now I understand what's going on. And that's very, very freeing too. But so to the high school folks, if you want to do this work on your own, you could do it. Um, it's going to be a little bit hard. It's a little bit frustrating, um, but you can do it. And, you know, I could, maybe I could try to provide some books and other, you know, materials for folks to, to kind of educate themselves, to get up to speed and then hit the ground running. Once you come to college, find out, you know, which, which universities have Chicano studies, ethnic studies and so on. Uh, meet with faculty. You could, it sounds really odd, but you could reach out through the website of the university and say, hey, I, I looked at what you were doing and hey, um, do you have time to like talk to me over email? What, what do you suggest I read? I just had a former grad, um, undergrad who's getting her MSW, Master's in Social Work at USC. And she said, Ralph, you know, I took your class last year. I know everything's going on right now. What's the best thing to read right now? Um, I took a couple days, but I finally responded to her. <laughs> so you know what we can do since um we're going to share this video you know um we'll make sure that we share it and maybe maybe accompanying could be uh some suggestions of, of some places because there are a couple questions on how to get started you know another student asked you know in terms of um getting involved in social activism you know where, where do you start just somewhat similar to, to response to getting involved in chicano studies but there's there are some differences um so yeah, you, you have a response to that one? Like, where, where, where would you start to get involved in social activism? Oh, man. So I'll, the only thing I have is like anecdotes, you know, like my own personal experience. And um, at UCSB, like, like over your shoulder, like there, um, uh, Marcus, is that, that that's kind of like a little bit of our ground zero, the Stork Tower uh, for demonstrations. At UCSB, there's another place called the Arbor. And there, I'm telling you, there's all kinds of people at the Arbor passing out information, sign up sheets. And it took me forever to like get, gather the courage because I was kind of an introverted person. And there were people would say, hey, come on over. You know, they're like kind of like salesmen. They're handing you flyers and you're like, ah, I don't want, I gotta go to class. And, uh, and but you know, then I saw a couple of people and I go, that guy's not crazy. I, actually, I talked to that guy the other day. He's a really nice guy, but no, I don't want, I don't want to talk to you. And so um, the way to get started is Usually those people that seem kind of crazy, they think what they're crazy about is changing the world. They're so dedicated that they are taking time out of their lives to do that. And, you know, sometimes we just, we don't pay them attention because we're too, we're too busy. But the way that I got started basically was I finally gathered the courage to go over there and have a civil conversation with folks. And they said, hey, we're watching a movie tonight on this issue. It, first for me, it was Central America. We're gonna watch this issue uh, about the war in El Salvador. Would you like to come to the movie? It's like six o'clock. Of course, they try to like sell you the food. Hey, we're gonna have pizza. So, you know, you gotta eat, right? And you know, it's no big deal. And then slowly you just become part of the whole thing. Not, not every, you know, it, it depends on the people who are there and depends on you. But um, I guess the way you get started is you gotta be open to it. And you gotta, there, you can find these people. They're very easy to find about, they're always like kind of wanting more and more people 
um, to join their organizations and they're out there online. You can find them on social media. And if it wasn't stupid COVID going on, of course they'd be out there right now. Even under COVID-like situations, there's still people doing demonstrations like tomorrow at 10 o'clock, no, at noon, sorry. At noon, there's a um, demonstration at the Isla Vista Foot Patrol here in, in Santa Barbara. People are gonna be wearing masks. They're gonna be responsible. Um, but if the way to get started is put your foot out there because mm -hmm. they're there and um, it's not always easy to find them, but if you want to find them, you will find them. Awesome. Okay, so speaking of wearing masks, <laughs> what, are you, what are your thoughts on people that are protesting uh, masks? Hold on for a second. Can you do this? Wait a minute. Okay. Uh, all right. Sorry, this is like live TV. <laughs> See this? Black Lives Matter? Okay, I just had to do that. I'm sorry. What's my opinion about folks not wearing masks? Is that the question? Or the, or the protest in general, like this. So it's, it's, it's their form of social activism, or how, to, how does that work? <clears throat> um, so people going to protests but not wearing masks? I'm sorry, Marcus. Mm -hmm. Like the people that are protesting against having to wear masks. Okay. Well, that is a form of activism, you know, and um, there are activists from all different shades, you know, along the political spectrum. Um, there are people that find that to be like an infringement upon their freedom. That's what they say. Um, you know, back in, in California here, because I'm still not sure, like, you know, I'm, I'm talking to this virtual group of people, but, um, there are a group of people down in Orange County that decided to say like, hey, you know, let's open up these restaurants, let's get back to business. Um, you know, and they operate underneath the guise of free speech, right? And so um, they have, do they have a right to say that? You know, that's, some people say that they do, other people say that they don't. Other people say, what about public safety, right? And so um, you see these, you know, folks from, and there's certainly people from the conservative side, more the Republican side, if you will, that also rely on spectacular speech to get their point across. I mean, there were a group of people, frankly, in Michigan, um, I can't remember the group exactly, but a kind of a far-right organization. They went into the state capitol in Michigan with guns. And they said, hey, we demand that the government basically reopen. This was back in April and May before some of the most, you know, we're living in a time where something that happened yesterday seems like it happened three years ago or three months ago or something like that. But that happened back in April and May. Um, I personally, I don't endorse that, but I, I do understand that um, people feel like they, they need to demonstrate and protest and try to get their point across. I agree. Um, okay, let's see. I think we have time for two more questions. So this, this is a good one. Could you speak to the use of, of the term Latinx? Um, I understand the origins, however, given the language is masculine feminine, it seems in some ways to diminish the heritage. Mm. Yeah, the, some people want to use the word um, or the spelling of Chicano, I mean, sorry, Latinx, Chicanex, to get rid of the CH beginning and begin with the X at the beginning. So you'd have an X at the beginning and an X at the end. The X at the end refers to somebody who's, you know, doesn't fit into the gender binary either male or female, somebody transgender. The X at the beginning is, reflects the indigenous roots of a lot of Chicanos and Latinos throughout the Western Hemisphere, so-called Western Hemisphere, right? So um, some people find it's off-putting as well. It's kind of clumsy. Um, it doesn't, um, it's not like a word that kind of necessarily, like the word Chicana and Chicano was something that was reclaimed. It was a bad word. It was a pejorative word. It was a put down. And then it became a positive word, queer also was like a put down and then queer became like a positive thing. And so um, like some people question its utility because it's not coming from the community. And if it's not coming from the community, it might be off putting. So maybe it's better to have labels such as Mexican or Salvadoran or something that's more like ethnic or country specific. Um, I find it a clumsy term. I understand why we're using it. And I do think it's, it's inclusive of people that don't file in that binary. But right now we're in a moment of flux and we're not really sure what we're going to call ourselves or who we are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Let's see. Last question. Oh my gosh. There's some good ones in here. Um, let's go with this one here. What do you think is the biggest or most, or most pressing Latinx issue right now that needs attention and support? 
what is the, the biggest Latinx issue that needs, um, well, I, I'll, I'll stray from the question. I think it's two things. One is obviously the immigration issue. Um, the families are still being separated from each other. The people, they're still like wanting to be reunited with their family members. They've been put in these detention centers. Uh, it's been going on for at least two or three years. It's, it's awful. The conditions that are sparking people to come here from Central America and Mexico haven't been really fully addressed. And then the other issue I'd say quickly is, is COVID. The level of um, the number of folks that are dying and, and, and getting sick as a result of COVID in the Black, Latino, and Indigenous communities are super high. And um, especially among young people, you know, there, there's this kind of still continuing mythology that, um, you know, initially said, oh, it's just folks that are in their 70s that are getting this. And then it was like, you know, old timers like me that are getting it in their 50s. But um, college students are and high school students. And with um, some of the K through 12 schools opening across the country, um, young kids, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old are getting COVID as well. So that really scares me. And um, the, the, the number of people that have been affected, especially within the Latino community who are essential workers, people who are farm workers, rest working in restaurants, working in other working class kind of positions, um, they're just out there, so to speak, um, exposed to COVID. And consequently, many of them are getting it. And sometimes um, they're bringing that back home and some of their family um, relatives and whatnot, they're getting sick as well. So um, I don't feel like enough is being done to address those two issues. I mean, literally the COVID issue is a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Well, Dr. Armbruster, I wanna thank you so much for, for spending your time with us and, and, and uh, providing this information. This, I mean, I, I learned a lot, you know, I think um, that the term social activism is kind of like housekeeping well, that, that's going to stick with me for a very long time because it's it's something you have to keep up. You know, it's something that's not you don't just do it once and then forget about it. It has to be something that's maintained, just like just like you know guarding your or cleaning your cleaning your house and things like that. So, um, thank you so so much for for your time and everything. Um, appreciate it. We will see you soon. If there's any other opportunities, you know, for for us to share information with each other, um, we'll make sure to do that. And I see your cute little kitty right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say something fast? I just want to thank everybody for listening and sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. And um, Marcus, I don't know if it's possible to put out here. Can I put something right here? Oh, shoot. Of I, want to put, I want to put my email address. Okay. That's all panelists, all panelists and attendees. Okay, real fast. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if people are going to get this. It says Ralph Armbruster at ucsb.edu. Okay, sorry, that's it. There it is, there it is. Okay, thank you again. Thank you again, Professor, and, and, and have a good afternoon. And, okay. and thank you all for attending. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.